Good afternoon, Honorable Justices. My name is Samuel Pevelin, and along with my co-counsel, Justine Scobie, we will be representing the appellant, KJM, for the case at bar. Would the justices care for a recitation of the facts? That's not necessary. You can go straight to your submissions. Perfect. So we have two submissions today. First, that the delay in this case was not reasonable, and so a stay should be granted. Second, that the presumptive ceilings in Jordan do not accommodate the need for timeliness in youth trials, and so a separate and lower presumptive ceiling of 15 months is required. Our order sought is that the Supreme Court of Lions Cup allow the appeal and grant this stay under sections 11B and 24.1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as well as to overturn the Supreme Court's decision in the case at bar. So to begin, I'm going to explain why this case requires a stay of proceedings. Although my co-counsel is going to advocate for lower presumptive ceilings of 15 months in youth cases, I submit to you today that under the current Jordan framework with presumptive ceilings of 18 months, a stay in this case should still be granted. The reason for that is because we submit that we disagree with the calculation of the final time of this trial with the majority in the Supreme Court of Canada. It is our submission that this case was 18 months and 28 days and not 15 to 16 months. The reason that this case took 18 months and 28 days is because it would be unjust to attribute two to three months of defense delay to KJM for arriving late, as well because the incomplete arrival of a voir dire transcript is not a discrete and exceptional circumstance. Understanding that then, Consistent with Jordan, we must apply the law as it stood, which is the Morin framework, which necessitates a stay in this case. So before I discuss KJM's late arrival, I submit to you today that we do not condone arriving late to court. It is a waste of court's time, it's a waste of the court's resources, it's disrespectful, and we do not want to encourage this behavior. The issue in this appeal and why we do not want to attribute two to three months of defense delay against KJM is because of the majority's reasoning as to how they determined two and a half hours arriving late at court leading to two to three months of defense delay. So counsel, should we just attribute the full five months and then call it a day? No, Justice. We should instead attribute one month of inherent delay and three and three quarters months of institutional delay consistent with Justice Valdu's reasoning in the Alberta Court of Appeal in this are, are you saying that the failure to arrive to court on time does not constitute any delay for the defense? Justice, what we say is that the issue in this appeal is how the Supreme Court came no, to no, no. My question was whether or not you are trying to argue that there should be no delay whatsoever attributable to the defense and for his failure to arrive on time. Yes, Justice. We are saying there should be no defense delay for KJM's failure to arrive on time. You don't think that's what caused the court to start with another proceeding, which of course delayed the proceeding, which of course caused significant delays in resuming the proceeding? No, Justice. No. We submit to you today. Sorry, Counselor, I'm going to interrupt you again. Is it your position that we should not attribute any of that delay to defense uh, purely because uh, the client the def uh, was a youth who was 15 years of age? Or are you indicating that that same rule should be applicable for all, def all defenders? No, Justice. We submit to you today that the reason why there should be no defense delay is because the majority's reasoning in determining two and a half hours being late resulting in two to three months is unfounded because there is no concrete evidence to suggest that KJM's late result resulted in a two to three month defense delay. 
But wasn't the Crown ready to proceed at 10 a.m. when court starts and the defendant was not in court? The Crown was ready to proceed at that time. And yeah. the failure to proceed was due to the defendant's failure to be on time. You'd agree with that? The Crown instead chose to deal with matters. That wasn't the question. The was it not the case that the, the case, the matter did not proceed because the defendant was not in court at 10 a.m. as required? Is that not that, correct? That's part of the reason, Justice, yes. However, part of the reason that it could be other reasons why this trial was being pushed back five months include factors such as a forensic report being late, uh, being disclosed late, the time it took to well, counsel, you're you're now you're now pivoting off of the, the 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 practical reality of the two and a half an hour lateness. You understand that missing half a day of court truly resulted in a full five day five hour time frame not being available later on. So I'm with Justice Benoit that you're lucky that the court did not attribute five months of delay. So I'm a bit shocked that you're now arguing that there shouldn't be any delay. So how do you respond to that? Yes, Justice, uh, I submit to you today that I am with Justice Karakastanis of the Supreme Court of Canada, where she put forth that there is the majority did not demonstrate clearly no evidence that KJM's late arrival resulted in a two to three month delay. The issue in this appeal is the majority's reasoning, how they attributed two and a half hours of being late to two to three months of defense delay. In a system where guilt must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt and the onus is on the state to prove that, it is unjust and sets a worrisome precedent that the Supreme Court, absent of any concrete evidence to prove that KJM's late arrival led to two to three months of defense delay should count against him because he arrived late to court. Counsel, wouldn't you suggest with, without evidence to the contrary, that the Crown would try to move these cases as proactive as possible. I mean, this is a youth matter. The Youth Criminal Justice Act guides the Crown in these types of motions. So the default, unless there's evidence to the contrary, would suggest that the Crown was being proactive and that the scheduling at five months was well within their purview as being proactive. Justice, yeah, we, would, we do agree with you that the Crown was being proactive. Apart from the facts when they sought to tender a statement made by M to the police, which was previously inadmissible, and that delayed the trial by five and a half months. However, in this case, there was also scheduling restrictions within that five month period before KJM could come back to court, in which case what counts as institutional delay is when the defense is ready to proceed, but the institution cannot accommodate that. So amidst these scheduling restrictions, admits the delays in the receiving of voir dire, admits the late disclosure of a forensic report, it is unjust then to attribute two to three months of defense delay for KJM's arrival when you cannot prove that that's the case. Moving forward, I will now explain why the incomplete arrival of the voir dire transcript is not a discreet and exceptional circumstance. Paragraph Jordan at 73, uh, the case of Jordan at paragraphs 73 and 75 inform us that a discrete and exceptional circumstance is something that is reasonably unforeseeable or reasonably unavoidable. Jordan also informs us at paragraph 71 that what is a discrete and exceptional circumstance is up to the trial judge's discretion. The same trial judge who ordered the voir dire transcript and did not catch that it was incomplete because they were on vacation, stated in this case that this is not a discreet and exceptional circumstance. So our position today, and we submit to you, is we agree Robert, with- Can you explain to me quickly and pointedly how uh, the court could have foreseen and avoided the transcript not having been uh, accurately or completely done at the time? So Justice, part of the way that the court could have found that the transcript was not completed in time is if the judge had not been on vacation. Now, that being said, we do agree with the majority in the Supreme Court that judges are not chained to their desks and they are allowed to take vacations. But 
a judge taking a vacation should not count against our client as just inherent delay. It happens. That would be unjust and unfair. Also, that trial judge, that same trial judge who could have caught it if they weren't on vacation said, this is not a discrete and exceptional circumstance. So when we apply the Jordan framework and it defers that judgment and authority to the trial judge who said this isn't a discrete and exceptional circumstance, we agree with them. And so for that reason- so counsel, counsel, can you explain to me then how you're weighing the conduct of the judge versus the conduct of the accused in this case? It seems to me being cavalier and late for two and a half hours is being characterized as some type of uh, problem of the justice system. But meanwhile, the conduct of the judge going on vacation, which clearly there are going to be mistakes and oversights in a justice system, is being attributed as nefarious and a culture of complacency. So, Justice, in this case, we would not say that the judge's behavior is uh, part of a culture of complacency and being nefarious. The issue here that I'm putting forth to you is that it's not a question of the behavior. It, we have to respect the Jordan framework as it stands, which at paragraph 71 defers the authority of deciding what is a discrete and exceptional circumstance to the trial judge. And it is the trial judge in this case who said this is not a discrete and exceptional circumstance. We do not believe and we do not submit that it is our role to overrule that decision made by the trial judge. And we should respect the Jordan framework as it stands. I'm sorry, aren't you the appellants? We are the appellants, Justice, yes. So you are asking us as a superior court to overrule the lower court's decision? Yes, Justice. So Three minutes remaining. You your submission that we should be respecting the Jordan framework doesn't make sense when you're actually asking us to vary that very framework and change the standard by which we judge you. Justice, you're correct. I'll concede on that point. My co-counsel is going to advocate for lower presumptive ceilings in the Jordan framework, and it needs to be applied. It is in my submission, however, I am applying the Jordan framework as it stands to, to receive a stay in proceedings for my client. I'll concede on that point. But given the fact that this is not a discrete and exceptional circumstance, we agree again with Justice Valdu of the Alberta Court of Appeal, who saw this trial, but this is one month of institutional delay. And so when you combine the three and three quarters months of institutional delay arriving from the rescheduling of the trial, as well as this uh, incident, the total and final time of this trial was 18 months and 28 days. Jordan, at paragraph 96, then informs us that in a transitional case such as this, with because this case was in the system when Jordan was established, we must apply the law as it existed, which is the Morin framework. The Morin framework gives us four factors to consider in a case. That is the length of the delay, the existence of a defense waiver, reasons for the delay, as well as prejudice felt against the accused. This must also be weighed against the seriousness of the offense. One minute remaining. Uh, Can you, you talk to us about prejudice? What do you see as the prejudice arising from the 28-day delay from the 28 that you say days. exists, assuming we accept all of your other arguments? The delay above the Jordan standard is 28 days. How is that not mitigated by the fact that this is a transitional case? Uh, so, Justice, may I uh, answer your question and also have a minute once time elapsed to conclude? Yes. So the presumptive ceiling of 18 months is not an aspirational target. 28 days over that is evidence of prejudice consistent with the Jordan framework because that whole idea of a presumptive ceiling is this is when prejudice is presumed. So it is our position that yes, 28 days late is in fact evidence of prejudice being felt by the accused in this case. And counsel, I'm just I'm just going to state this. I, I understand what you're doing here. You're being brave and you're accepting the Jordan framework. You're, you're basically racing to try and eat, meet that 18 months. But you can't have it both ways, counsel. You can't say that there isn't a two to three month subtraction from you, but then not count those 28 days on the back end. Do you understand? You can't have it both ways. 
Justice, if you could just clarify your position a bit further, I'm afraid I don't follow. You're you're accepting the Jordan framework, aren't you? You're trying to suggest that that a stay should be granted because it there's prejudice immediately after the 18 months, right? Uh, it, it, that is part of my submission, yes. So, I mean, it's slightly confusing the, the argument you're making, but I understand it now. But Justice Goldlist is now asking you about these 28 days in the transition. So it sounds like you don't want to recognize that 28 days as being a transition. Is that correct? So uh, seeing as Jordan came out in July 6th of, uh, or I believe it was July, July 8th of 2016, and in this case continued after that, I would say that time post Jordan is part of the transition. And that was about 15 months into the trial. So there's Five. about four months. Uh, thank you. Could I just uh, conclude my submission or? Just concluding comment, yep. Just concluding comment. Uh, the stay of proceedings should be granted because if we apply the Jordan framework as it stands, this case is above the 18 months. My co-counsel will now explain why we need lower ceilings for you. Thank you, Justice. Thank you, Mr. Pebble. Good afternoon, Justices. May I proceed? Yes, you may. My name is Justine Scobie, and I will be concluding submissions on behalf of the appellant, KJM. It is our submission that Jordan does not adequately accommodate the timely proceeding in youth criminal justice trials. Instead, a separate and lower ceiling of 15 months is required. Honorable Justices, we're faced with a decision today. Either we can guarantee youth their Section 11B charter proceeding by respecting this unique and separate criminal justice system designed for them by parliament and jurisprudence and thereby preserving the principles of Jordan, or we can jeopardize youth's right to, a, to Section 11B of the charter rights by tacking an adult framework onto youth criminal justice system and thereby eroding the principles of Jordan. You passed- Counsel, but didn't, but didn't the judges in Jordan actually go on to say that they only put the ceilings in, in place to end the complacency and to end any confusion about where the prejudice starts? So if we're acknowledging Jordan at the 18 and 30 month, why would we start to create a separate ceiling for the youth justice system, which actually doesn't and has not demonstrated any complacency or delays? Justice, Jordan was enacted as a proactive measure to enhance simplicity and clarity in the criminal justice system. It was a proactive measure taken to ensure that criminal justice proceedings in the adult criminal justice system do not exceed an unreasonable amount of time. Now, youth have a unique relationship with the criminal justice system, and they have a heightened need and a heightened vulnerability in the criminal justice system and have an enhanced need for a timely criminal justice proceeding. This was not accommodated or recognized in the development of the Jordan framework. Youth criminal justice system has had a longstanding acknowledgement of diminished moral blameworthiness and heightened vulnerability. This dates back to 1908 in the Juvenile Delinquent Act, where it was explicitly stated that youth suffer from heightened vulnerability in the criminal justice system. This was more recently codified in 2008 in the Queen versus D. B. And Council, we don't we don't need a recitation of the legislation. We understand it. So, I mean, I, this is the question I have for you. What? Why? Why are you here? It is not setting ceilings the job of the legislature? Why, why are the courts getting involved in, in, in setting numbers for ceilings? Why are we doing it? Justice, in the Youth Criminal Justice Act's preamble, it's stated that it's up to the members of society to protect the youth criminal justice system and ensure that youth are, youth needs are, and developmental issues are met. And 
that it's up to us. Sorry, to counsel, sorry counselor, and I apologize for interrupting. Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback and I have been all morning, I think because we have a lot of judges who aren't muting. Uh, would it be possible for our judges to mute uh, unless they're asking a question? Uh, just because it's cutting out constantly. Just make sure they get the time back. May I proceed? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. So just to clarify your question, uh, Justice, you're asking, sorry, can you please repeat the question? Yeah, my, my question was simply, why is it this court's function to set numbers for ceilings? Is that not the function of the legislature who drafted the law, who drafted the Youth Criminal Justice Act? It is, the onus is on us, as indicated in the Youth Criminal Justice Act, to protect the needs of our young people. And in the case at Bar, it's, it's established that there's this heightened need for a timely proceeding where the Jordan framework does not address that. What's considered reasonable for adults of 18 months in a presumptive ceiling is not reasonable for youth. When it comes to youth, 18 months is a significant amount of time. A 15-year-old suffering from a, their, criminal, their, their interactions with the criminal justice system, if their proceedings take 18 months, this is a significant amount of time. It takes, it's a more significant amount of time than an adult due to their less developed cognitive ability to connect their consequences actions to their consequences, they have a less developed memory and a less developed perception of time. And Council, I'm going to interrupt you. Couldn't those same arguments be made about people in other vulnerable groups, such as those suffering from mental health issues and those suffering from addictions? Don't you think that this opens up the door to other groups requesting their own separate ceiling and their own separate set of rules? Perhaps, Justice. However, what makes the youth unique is that they're the only acknowledged class in Canadian law that have an entirely separate system for them. And of course- Why? There's the Mental Health Act and the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. They're two pieces of legislation that are distinct from the criminal code. Indeed, Your Honor. However, the youth criminal justice system has an entirely separate system with that identifies people that fall into this uh, legislation. And within this legislation, a core tenant is that they have a heightened need for a timely proceeding. At heart is the societal interest in rehabilitating and reintegrating the youth into society. Now, if a case is taking anything longer than 15 months, which is considered presumptively unreasonable in the Queen versus M. Bracket GC in 1991, a stay beneath the ceiling will have to be granted. Now, Jordan sets out that a stay beneath the ceiling of 18 months will only be granted in rare and clear cases. This was established to enhance simplicity and clarity and predictability in the criminal justice system. Ms. Gobi, I'm just gonna to get to it. What is your suggestion for what this, the number should be for this presumptive ceiling for youth? Presumptive ceiling should be 15 months at the absolute maximum. Keeping in mind that this 15 month presumptive ceiling is not a deadline that the criminal justice system aspires to. It's an absolute backstop where anything after 15 months is considered unreasonable for a youth. Why 15? Why not 14? In 1991, in the Queen versus M bracket GC, it was established that 15 months is the absolute deadline. However, 12 is more ideal. So let me let me take Justice Goldless point and let me expand that. So you have a youth. You say it should be 15. What if it's an Aboriginal youth with a controlled substance issue? What should the what should the what should the presumptive ceiling be for for that for that youth? Justice, the issue at hand is whether a presumptive ceiling is needed for all youth in the criminal justice system. Well, I already heard your number about all youth. I want to know about this other minute issue. Similar Aboriginal youth with drug issue. What's the new number? It is our submission that we're taking the principles of Jordan and applying it to the use of the system by lowering a presumptive ceiling. Now, in that presumptive ceiling, it's our contention that 
stays beneath the ceiling will be a legislation and a framework that will have to be further discussed. However, the issue that we're dealing with here is whether the youth in the criminal justice system need a lower presumptive ceiling of 15 months to begin with. This is a starting point. Sorry, um, okay, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm going to- Can I ask to a quick question about the clarity that Jordan brought and how we would undermine it now by bringing in multiple ceilings and different assessments as to whether 11B applies to a different group in a different manner? Pretty, can you uh, repeat the question, Justice? Why would we bring in multiple ceilings? Because the whole point of Jordan was to clarify the 11B analysis. Certainly, Justice. And our contention is that we aren't asking for multiple ceilings. We are asking for a ceiling in consistency with Parliament's direction and over 100 years of jurisprudence that clarifies a ceiling for youth criminal justice system. The stay beneath um, the ceiling is- Counselor, Counselor I'm gonna interrupt you. I'm gonna go back to what uh, Justice Ong was indicating in terms of youth that suffer from a multiplicity of afflictions, uh, such as the indigenous youth with addictions issues or possibly mental health issues. Is there another test that you're suggesting that we could use as opposed to a 15 month presumptive ceiling test? Not quite, Justice. What I'm contending today is that a 15-month presumptive ceiling is the starting point of applying the principles of Jordan to the youth criminal justice system. It is acknowledging that the principles of Jordan were to enhance clarity, simplicity, and predictability as soon as accused enter the youth criminal justice system. Now, applying that to so, the- So, counsel, I'm just going to, I'm going to make you make a choice, okay? So are you suggesting there should only be one ceiling for youth and that's it? Or would you be open to further arguments down the road at this court for other ceilings? Which one is it? Justice, we're, our starting point here today is that we require a lower presumptive ceiling of 15 months for all youth who fall into the youth criminal justice system from the ages 12 to 18. You use the word starting point, but I'm talking about other groups. Are you saying that if they come here to court, that we should be open to hearing their arguments too. Which one is it? Can you, Justice, can you please repeat the last part of your question? I'm just asking you if, if you're just arguing for the ceiling now for youth only, or are you open to other arguments about other ceilings for other immutable groups? We are contending today just one ceiling, 15 months for all youth between the ages of 12 to 18 in the youth criminal justice system. Applying the ceiling would preserve the principles of Jordan. Jordan's framework was, the Jordan framework enacted a system where stays beneath the ceiling would only be granted in rare and clear cases. However, tacking this onto youth criminal justice proceedings, where as we have established, we'll have to take a more, a more timely proceeding, erodes the exact principles of rare and clear cases in the Jordan framework. The majority Counselor, I have Three another question for you. Um, if, if we buy your argument that there should be a presumptive ceiling of 15 months for youth, uh, what is your position on whether or not the below ceiling test has any kind of applicability, applicability moving forward for youth? What is your position on how we should approach a below ceiling test? Justice, I believe, pardon me, I contend that that is a valid concern and a valid question that requires more merit. However, the issue that we're dealing with today is in, is lowering the presumptive ceiling for youth to 15 months and applying the principles from Jordan of enhancing predictability and clarity in the youth criminal justice system by lowering the system for youth. In doing this, we are respecting the distinction between the adult and the youth criminal justice system and being consistent with parliament and jurisprudence. We're guaranteeing young people their protection to section 11B of the charter right to a proceeding in a timely manner. Tacking on Jordan onto youth and granting stays beneath the ceiling for the majority of youth erodes the principles of Jordan and only Sorry, so can, you, can you help me understand why youth should have a different constitutional standard with respect to 11b when they do not have a different constitutional standard with respect to any other charter rights 
Justice, it is our contention that all members in society, especially those who enter the criminal justice system, deserve equal protection. Section 11B would require, is establishing, or states that all accused are, may I please have a moment for indulgence, Justice? Yes. You have one minute remaining. Thank you. May I have a moment to answer your question and then a moment to conclude? Yes. It is our contention that granting youth equal protection to their Section 11B as established in the Canadian Charter requires a differential treatment and a differential application. The Jordan principles or the Jordan framework established principles that are very translatable to the youth criminal justice system but require a different application. This different application is a lower presumptive ceiling of 15 months to guarantee youth their right to Section 11B. The preamble of the Youth Criminal Justice Act states that it's our society's responsibility to, to protect the needs of young people who have a heightened need for timely proceedings. Using Jordan's principles, and guaranteeing them to a timely trial means lowering their presumptive ceilings to 15 months. It is our submission that we lower the presumptive ceilings to 15 months to adequately accommodate for the need for timely proceedings in the youth criminal justice system. All questions, if there aren't any further questions, I conclude my submissions. Thank you, Council. May I proceed? Yes, you may. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Justice and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the Lions Cup. My name is Khalid, initial H, and along with my co-counsel, Alwani, initial M, we are team number 15, and we represent the, we represent they responded Her Majesty the Queen in this matter. The respondent requests that the Supreme Court of the Lion Cup uphold the lower court's decision and dismiss the appeal. The respondent will be making two submissions today. I will be addressing the first submission and my co-counsel will be addressing the second submission. First, the respondent submits that the presumptive ceiling in the Jordan framework applies in youth criminal justice proceedings. And second, that the delay in the appellant's case was reasonable. In support of the fourth submission, the respondent submits that the presumptive ceilings in the Jordan framework applies in youth criminal justice proceedings. It is supported by the following. First, the Jordan framework can adequately accommodate the increased need of timeliness as mandated in the YCJA for cases involving accused young persons. And second, there should not be a separate ceiling to give effect to an accused young person's Section 11B right. I begin with my first submission that the Jordan framework can adequately accommodate the increasing of timeliness as mandated by the YCJA, which is short from the, for the Youth Criminal Justice Act, in cases of involving accused young persons. The majority in the appellant's case is paragraph two, if uh, I may direct the, sorry, if I may, the, if I may direct the, um, the justices to, um, in the, case, my apologies, the, major, the majority in the appellant's case at paragraph two state that the Jordan framework came about in 2018 to eradicate this culture of complacency that was so prevalent in the criminal justice system. This is the very culture that confused an appropriate determination of section 11b of the charter, which states that any person charged with an offense must be trialed within a reasonable time. So it is the respondent's position. Not, really. So if we don't give life and meaning to the YCGAA by suggesting that an interpretation of the 11B right requires a lower presumptive ceiling, then really, what fairness are we doing? And, and, and really, we're just dismissing the Youth Criminal Justice Act, an instrument of Parliament. It is the respondent's position that according to YCJA, subsection 3, 
um, subparagraphs four and five, which um, state the enhanced need of timeliness in that there must be timely intervention that reinforces the link between offending behavior and its consequences, as well as the promptness and speed with which persons responsible for enforcing this act must act. We would, it, is the it is the respondent's position that these principles in the YCJA are already, are already codified in the YCJA in that procedures are already put in place. So there is no need to over overcomplicate this uh, principle in adjusting the current standard of uh, Section 11B's determination. Counsel, I mean, you, you just cited the preamble. I mean, that argument could be easily turned around to say that a presumptive ceiling of perhaps 15 months or more or so is exactly in line with what the legislator, which is legislative uh, drafters intended here. So how do you respond to that? With respect to our friends who have stated that 15 months is a dire need for youths in particular, it is the respondent's position that first of all, um, first of all, it is not founded in the uh, by the very notion of constitutional standard that simply because YCJA mandated an increased need of timeliness, that thus it equates to having a lowered ceiling. Otherwise, Parliament would have that ability, as I would direct the um, justice to refer to in the Supreme Court decision at paragraph 66, that um, if this was the case, that the stark distinction between youth criminal justice system and the adult criminal justice system was so was such that it it um, necessitates a separate ceiling, however low or how, how, however high. Um, this would be a permission that Parliament would have through ordinary statutory amendment, and with it, such an ordinary statutory amendment. Um, Parliament would be able to merge adult adult criminal system with the youth criminal system, or even separate them. Um, but counsel, and this is not counsel. You seem to be suggesting that we should interpret constitutional rights rigidly and not substantively. Certainly, we must yeah. be aware of of individuals and how they apply to certain groups. And if the Youth Criminal Justice Act suggests that there is prejudice over delay, then we must interpret that when we try to evaluate an 11B infringement on a youth. So it's really not, it's, it's how we define and apply the 11B. Yes, um, this is the very uniformity that Jordan created. The respondent submits that it is very, very important that, important that section 11B in determination is predictable, consistent, and clear because of the underlying notion of procedural fairness. The Jordan framework consistently provides that procedural fairness by way of applying a rigid 18-month ceiling for provincial courts and rigid 30-month ceiling for um, superior courts. And this is uh, not an, uh, sorry, and an accused young person is not an exception to this rule, and it does not compromise the provisions in the YCJA. Further, no, we have no evidence. Burden. But right, wouldn't they, aren't they given a heavier burden because now the rebuttable presumption is at 18 months. Meanwhile, the Youth Criminal Justice Act suggests it should be at much sooner. So now there's an increased burden uh, placed upon youth that sh actually should not rest with them. Our interpretation of the Section 11B for youth should provide substantive uh, meaning to that. It is the respondent's position. No, I, I agree. However, I disagree with the position that a, an accused youth is a more is at a more disadvantaged position post Jordan than they were pre Jordan. Pre Jordan, eighty percent of the appellant's case was under the Moran framework, where prejudice was something that had to be proven, and I and it is the respondent's position that that puts a vulnerable youth at a more um, higher onus of burden because prejudice is very very subjective and thus. Jordan framework eradicates this notion that prejudice must be proven with a strict 18 month ceiling. And once the ceiling is surpassed, then prejudice is in inferred. Um, Counsel, with respect, who cares what framework the prejudice or the delay was done? The fact of the matter is practically speaking, the youth was not getting their trial. Do you agree with me? 
I agree with you in that position. However, it is not the standard of care that the Crown initially held. The Defence Council let the youth down, right? And this is in a direction that the that a respondent would like to make on the appellant, that why didn't Defence Council do more to expedite proceedings? And this is evident in their lack of standard of care. And this is a hypocrisy on the side of the appellants to say that, no, um, the two and a half the hour of delay is something that we cannot, we are going to distance ourselves for, from. Um, and this goes back to my submissions. How would, how would you suggest that we treat the fact that uh, this case was done 80% under pre-Jordan and is a transitional case uh, where the requirements of defense counsel uh, was substantively different than it is post-Jordan? So how would you like us to treat this as a transitional case? It is the respondent's position that even with 80% of the case being under Moran, the appellant has never wavered their Section 11B right, and they have never indicated any inferred or actual prejudice, and this is on the part of the defense counsel. Jordan takes into account this transitional case exception to in saying that at paragraph 69 of the, of the Supreme Court decision, Jordan created ceilings, not floors. And with that comes an internal uh, an ability, an added an ability for a youth to factor into the consideration that they are they are, y are young, they're an, they're a teenager, etc. In the below ceiling test. Counsel, do you agree that youth are more vulnerable than adults? Yes, they are indeed vulnerable, more vulnerable from oh. adults, but so are other sorts. Pardon? Sorry but so are all other vulnerable members of societies. And for the, our, our councils to say that on the sole basis that there, are such, there is such a system of youth court proceedings, but I would, it is the respondent's position that there are also other court, court systems for other vulnerable youths, though they may not have the such name as what? of court. What are the other such designated court systems? Yes, tribunals, um, agencies, boards, commissions, they all, which are, there are 500. What does that have to do with period. criminal matters? The charter applies to people who are charged with a criminal offense. We're not talking about a tribunal dealing with a landlord and tenant dispute. A criminal, a criminal can be someone who faces disability. A criminal can be someone who, who, who is in the drug system. How is, for instance, an adult who has mental disabilities or an adult who has a drug-related background, how are they accounted for um, using the our friend's but argument of- they're not in of, a separate court uh, system. They're not in a separate court system. There's an adult court and a youth court. There's not a separate court for individuals who, for example, are suffering from mental health issues. They're dealt with either in the adult court system or the youth court system, depending on how old they are. So if there's a different court system for adults versus youth, why wouldn't we set a clear lower ceiling that would help the youth courts to determine when a case is taken too long? We res would remaining. respect but disagree that there is that there is no separate court system for a a um, somebody who is coming out of a drug. Um, background or someone with a disability because the human rights tribunals deal with them. No, they and, don't. Um, the human rights tribunal do not deal with people charged with criminal offenses. I'm not sure where you get that information from counsel. The human rights takes into account different, uh, different uh, factors in the case. And sometimes it is in the, in the factums of the, the appellant during human rights uh, tribunal trials to say that you must to to plead that the, um, the adjudicator must account for certain vulnerable and heightened level of prejudice. Furthermore, there is no indication in um, in the post Jordan world. My apologies. 
There is no indication in the post Jordan world that a youth who wants to expedite their trials are not being accommodated for, nor is there any suggestion that within the youth criminal justice system that they are not taking into account Jordan. And there is no evidence, likewise, that young persons were worse off in Jordan than they are post Jordan. It is also important to note that three of the majority judges in the appellant's case, Justices Moldaver, Justices Wagner, and Justice uh, Gascon, they were on this very same panel who wrote Jordan and who established those ceilings and who allowed the stay in Jordan. If indeed Jordan uh, indeed applied, uh, intended to apply to the youth criminal justice ceiling, oh, sorry, youth criminal justice proceeding, they would have dissented in the appellant's case. However, they did not. This indicates but a counsel, fair application of section an accurate statement. Our learned judges at the lower court were not presented with arguments about the Youth Criminal Justice Act, nor were they presented arguments about the youth. So we can't say or infer that they contemplated the limits and prejudice that, that they set would be inclusive One minute the remaining. Youth Criminal Justice Act. So, it's, so we can't Sorry. rely on that rationale. Sure. However, it is also significant to note that those who were in the panel that wrote Jordan dissented with the premonition that um, the ceiling does not apply to youth. The criminal ceiling does not apply to youth. So it is the respondent's position that um, the defense counsel for the appellant acted in resigned acquiescence. To ask for a lowered ceiling, however low, is essentially an act to ask for a preferential treatment. And further, it um, discriminates those who have reached the cusp of 18 and above. With respect to the counsel's um, comments on the cognitive abilities of a 15-year-old, the appellant was tried when he was 17 and on the cusp of 18. How stark could it could the cognitive abilities be between someone who is 17 and someone who is on the cusp or somebody who is 18. Um, with, with respect to the, the, the sentence itself, um, Jordan was only in, incarcerated for nine days out of the entire, uh, from the beginning till the end. Uh, this does not show any prejudice to uh, the appellant. Thus, um, sorry, the Thus, it is the position of the respondent that Jordan Framework actually allows a youth to appreciate the ability between actions and consequences, Time. which is a principle that is mandated in the YCJA. The respondent thus sub submits that presumptive ceilings in Jordan Framework applies in YCJA. Counsel, that was time. That was time. My co-counsel will submit her submissions, barring any qu questions. Questions, those are my submissions. Thank you. May I proceed? Yes, counsel, proceed. Good afternoon, Chief Justice and Justices of the Honorable Court of Lions Cup. My name is Kalwani, first initial M, and I continue to represent the respondent in the matter today. The respondent submits that the total delay of nearly 15 to 16 months in this case is reasonable. To this effect, I have two submissions to make. First, that the calculation of delay set forth by the Supreme Court is appropriate. And second, should this court find that the 18 month ceiling should apply in this case, the test for reaching this conclusion has not been satisfied and hence the appellant section 11B right has not been violated. Jordan, at paragraph 96, defines a transitional exception as a circumstance which may arise where the charges were laid before the release of this case. This case is that transitional exception. The most important feature of Jordan is that it sets a ceiling beyond which delay is presumptively unreasonable. Application of this framework leads us to gut sorry, guides us to calculate the total delay from the charge to the anticipated end of the trial. In this case, as founded by the majority in the Supreme Court, the net delay is 15 to 16 months. We must now assess the reasons why this delay occurred. 
The first being the actions of the accused. On the morning of March 2, 2016, when all other justice system participants were ready to proceed with the scheduled trial, the appellant did not appear. Ultimately, Counsel, perhaps you could take a step back and then try to justify the Crown's actions in the delay of the voir dire and whether he actually wanted the statements included or not. Perhaps if they would have acted uh, a little more proactively at that time, then they could have avoided the voir dire. That is correct. They could have avoided the voir dire, but given the fact that this is a transitional case and that the fact that the Crown has the discretion to ask for a voir dire justifies the delay in this case. Oh, so the Crown can drag himself along, but the accused has the burden of moving this case proactively forward. Is that your position? The onus is on the justice to proactively expedite the proceedings. If the, uh, if the appellant finds that the delay is unreasonable, there is a test that Jordan sets forth, a two-step test, where they can justify or satisfy both the steps and claim for their unreasonable delay. Counsel, my question really is going to the point that you're trying to assert that the delay that was created by his late appearance at the voir dire caused a significant delay. But my question is the delay in the Crown actually acting on getting the statements admitted in the court created the need for the voir dire, which therefore set in this late accumulation of delay also. So shouldn't Just, there be some shared culpability here? Just as there is a shared culpability here, we are not uh, trying to attribute the entire five month delay from the rescheduling of the March 2, 2016 trial. We are attributing only two or two and a half months to the defense delay. The Crown takes the responsibility and attributes the rest either to themselves or institutional delay. Ultimately, it was the appellant's late appearance that created a need to find a five-hour time slot rather than a two-hour time, two-and-a-half-hour time slot. This results in a net delay of 15 to 16 months. The respondent submits that the four-and-a-half months delay to the next available trial date of July 28, 2016 is attributable to the appellant and should constitute as defense delay. Moving to the second reason, the discrete exceptional circumstance. The trial judge erred in her finding that this case does not require the test of a discrete exceptional circumstance. The trial judge erred in applying the clearest and rarest of cases as argued by my friends. Jordan defines the discrete exceptional circumstance as events that are either reasonably unforeseen or reasonably unavoidable and cannot be remedied by either the Crown or the justice system. Here, the exceptional circumstance was the delivery of the late and incomplete Wardia transcript requested by the trial judge to reserve her decision. What was pivotal in Jordan's reasoning was that the Crown's ability to mitigate the delay specifically, not the ability of the state generally to mitigate the delay. Therefore, the respondent submits that the approximate one month delay resulting from this institutional error must be subtracted from the total delay. This leaves a net delay of 15 to 16 months falling well under the 18 month ceiling. But counsel, isn't isn't that the whole problem with this issue? It, you know, it's been 24 years or so since Moran. And despite two different systems, we still have what I would see to be a complacency, uh, a culture of complacency. And in particular, I want you to answer this question. Rush transcripts can be ordered. And there can be methods, especially in today's electronic environment, for trial judges to review transcripts. So, so should not this court do better? Should we not aspire to do better? Firstly, sorry. No, an First, answer, answer the question, please. Firstly, uh, the delay falls at the feet of the Administ code administration 
In the jurisdiction of Alberta, the administ court administration is responsible for the expedited delivery of transcripts. The trial judge was on vacation when the transcript arrived to her office. Judges are not chained to their desks. Had the trial judge been in office, she could have listened to the recordings of the trial and accordingly deliberated on the result of the decision. But counsel, you would agree that judges are part of the court system and delays caused by the court system are supposed to be attributed to the Crown. Uh, so how, so answer that for me, please. That is correct. However, in this case, the delay was not the Crown delay. It was the delay caused by the institution, which in the small jurisdiction of Fort McMurray is endemic. And change takes time. We cannot expect that the Jordan framework released four months left time in the trial of the of KJM to accommodate to immediately uh, accommodate the unreasonable delay in this case as argued by the appellant however as we argue the d delay was 15 to 16 months counsel if the I'm appellant to you for a second um if this court determines that the appropriate ceiling for youth matters should be 15 months, as the appellants are asking us to do, why should we not stay the charges against KJM since they are within the 15 to 16 month range? You put the delay at 15 to 16 months. If this court decides that the appropriate ceiling for youth matters should be 15 months, why should the charges for KJM not be stayed? Just as Jordan put forth, there might be a, if you choose to lower the ceiling, there has to be an alternative test for the appellant, like in this case, to justify their delay. No, no, there doesn't have to be a justification if we move the ceiling to 15 months. If 15 months becomes a new presumptive ceiling for youth matters, which is what the appellant is asking this court to do, then why should KJM's charges not be stayed since even on your analysis, it's within the 15 to 16 month range, which means it is over the 15 month presumptive ceiling. Since this is a transitional case and has a discrete exceptional circumstance, that discrete exceptional circumstance demands to flexibly and contextually account for the challenge that Fort McMurray faces. I'm, I'm confused. Doesn't your exceptional and discrete circumstance still lower your analysis to 15 to 16 months of delay? Yes. Okay, so clearly the discrete exceptional circumstance you're arguing can't possibly justify us not granting a state to KGM, KJM if we lower the ceiling, right? Yes, if, but if he does lower the ceiling, the change that you are asking for will take time to accommodate. Had the trial judge known that you are lowering the ceiling to 15, they would have accommodately tried, accordingly so, tried to... So there's nothing, there's nothing particular about the facts of KJM that would justify us not granting the stay should we choose to lower the ceiling. Is that what you're saying? If the appellant requests, the KJM requests for a lower... Uh, for a well, you already know that is what they're asking us to do. You're aware of that because your friend has been making submissions in that regard. So it's not a question of if they're asking, they are asking. And if we, the court, grant their request and agree that the ceiling should be lowered, I'm asking you for some specific reasons why the charges against KJM should not be stayed. Can you provide any? This is going back to the calculation of delay. You've uh, already calculated a 15 to 16 months. Council, you've already made yes. the calculations. How, yes. But the fact that we reached to those calculations is that the, we have to account for the one month institutional delay that has taken place in this case. The fact that the appellant did not show up on time. The fact that the appellant only put on appellants uh, defense counsel only put on record that they have not waived their section that would be right it's Just not in enough in the interest of time you're still arguing that you're basically still arguing that there should only just be one ceiling um 
essentially, because um, based on your submissions, your calculation of the delay is more than 15 months, which is what your friends across the aisle are asking us to rule in favor of. So if we disagree with your co-counsel's submissions and we decide to lower this, the, the time limit to 15, your submissions become completely irrelevant then. That's the, that's the point I think um, my fellow justice is trying to get you to understand. So. Yes, but we have to account for the seriousness of the offense in this case. When our friends were referring to the prejudice caused to KJM, we should also take into account the prejudice caused to the 16-year-old 16, uh, 16 victim in this case. The victim has suffered 25 scars to the side of his head and 14 scars, staples, to the side of his neck which are completely irreversible when society is asking for an expedited proceeding for such a youth who has committed such a serious offense of aggravated assault and possession of weapon for a dangerous purpose. They must also take into account the prejudice that is caused to the 16-year-old victim in this case. But, Counselor, you'll have to agree that uh, expediting hearings and trials and making sure that they take place in an appropriate amount of time uh, would serve the victim better as and including uh, and would serve the defense better. So how is that an argument uh, for your side? Justice, under the older Morin framework, that would have been impossible to done. Morin asked for four characteristics and four factors to be satisfied in order to grant a stay in that situation for the appellant. However, Jordan eradicates those circumstances and factors and presumes the prejudice that is caused to the appellant. The respondent submits that with the application of the contextual approach that is sensitive to the party's reliance on the previous state of the law, that the case did not take markedly longer than it reasonably should have. The Jordan framework adequately accommodates the enhanced need for timeliness Under one in, minute remaining. in youth cases, given that it includes the entire justice system and not just youth cases. There was no crown delay after Jordan was issued. Seriousness of offenses and prejudice had pivotal role to play for 80% of this case's history, which subsequently governed the crown's conduct. The accused has failed to satisfy the below ceiling test, making the, making the delay in this transitional case reasonable. The respondent submits, sorry, the respondent requests that the Supreme Court of Lions Cup uphold the lower court's decision and dismiss the appeal. Barring any further questions, those are my submissions. Counsel, I have one last question for you. Yes. So you know that youth, like individuals charged under the Youth Criminal Justice Act go to the provincial court rather than the superior court, which already kind of puts them on the 18-month um, time limit rather than the 30-month time limit. So we already have an instance where these kind of different parallel, well, th these different kind of court systems are treated differently explicitly under the uh, Jordan framework, um, which didn't specifically address um, the, the separate criminal justice system that we have for youth. So I guess the question is, if there are already two ceilings, what's the problem with having three based on the fact that we have these separate court systems? First of all, Justice, nowhere in Jordan it, does it state that these ceilings do not apply so we to are youth out criminal of time. justice. Okay. If it's okay with the judges, you can just answer this question and quickly conclude. Yes. Uh, nowhere in Jordan does it state that the uh, that these ceilings do not apply to youth criminal justice system. The fact that Jordan is flexible enough and does take into the into its account the contextual uh, factors of any given case, and the fact that the appellant could have satisfied this test, and that means his stay was granted but that does not happen in KJM's case. He is not going to be acquitted of the charges because he did not satisfy the test. So Jordan has a two-prong uh, 
benefit, one that it does grant uh, prejudice and that it grants flexible and contextual approach and two that it has a test in place for the appellant to satisfy to get to be granted a stay under the ceiling the 18 month ceiling thank you Councilor. barring any further questions thank you. thank you barring any further questions those are my submissions thank you thank you so much for that uh so that concludes this round. We do have break after this round. Uh, so in the other round or the, uh, the other chat, in that chat, the teams moving forward will be announced. And then from two, uh, about 2.05, to 3.15 is when the final round will happen. So I'm going to ask the competitors to please exit this chat. So the judges have a few minutes to figure out which team will be moving forward.